yeah, so coming up, an interview that's probably in my top five, top ten interviews is a, a guy who really knows what's going on, been in the... Uh, in, as an institutional trader doing this and he's very keen on lifting the lid on his experience and inf- uh, letting people kind of know his opinions very fairly strong opinions yes well we love strong opinions on two blokes trading don't we mate so absolutely entertaining interview here he is Two Blokes Trading welcomes Paul Scott. Paul has worked in the financial services sector since 1994 and has traded commodities, metals and forex for major investment banks. He now operates PaulScottFX.com and is here today to talk to us about trading supply and demand levels and many other things I'm sure. Paul, hello, welcome. Hi guys, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, here to talk about sort of institutional supply and demand trade, uh, and obviously we'll be getting onto probably a few more topics uh, from there as well. Uh, just like to say hello to everybody, and uh, sort of hope you enjoy this podcast, and hopefully it will uh, sort of open your eyes and uh, into the world of institutional trading as opposed to retail trading because they are two different beasts. Yeah, it's one of our favourite topics on on this show. Is really kind of trying to get to know what it is that people that do this for a living, as in are paid by a big institution to do this, do what they do that we don't do. <laughs> and yeah. and it, that's that's your that's your whole thing, right? I've been on your website, and that is what you're passionate about by the looks of it, Paul. So yeah. very yeah. keen to get into that. But we always like to start with a little bit of information, a little bit of a background about the person that we're yeah. speaking to. So sure. I headlined it there, Paul, but could you give us it in your own words? Yeah, indeed. I mean, I was very fortunate to uh, sort of have a father that worked uh, and traded in the city for a very long time, uh, sort of around about sort of 35 years on the London Metal Exchange. And uh, as dads do, uh, at the age of 16, I just left school and he said, right, my son, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Um, I'm 16. I said, I've not got a clue, Dad. <laughs> so he said to me, right, you're going to come and work with me um, for some work experience. You're not going to get paid, but, you know, I'll get you a couple of suits and some, you know, shirts and ties and the likes. And you can come and get some experience um, until we can sort of find you uh, a job. So sort of went up there, you know, sort of fresh faced at the age of 16, basically a glorified tea boy. Um, get taken down to the London Metal Exchange. Uh, day one complete chaos i mean these guys all knew what they were doing to me it was just complete and utter chaos they were talking in a language that was foreign to me you know backwardations contangos and i'm thinking what the hell is all this um got to the end of the first day and dad turns around and he said well what did you make of that i said i'll never get the hang of that in a million years he said, that's funny because that's exactly what I said the first day I came down here. But, you, you, you know, you, you get to know it. You get to know what you're doing. You get to learn the terminology. You get to learn um, how people approach trading and how people approach markets. Um, you know, so, I mean, I started off at Credit Leonay, uh, Credit Leonay Rouse, which was the brokerage arm of the uh, investment bank Credit Leonay. Uh, sort of moved from there to Sugden Financial. Uh, moved from Sugden Financial to Society General. Uh, moved from Society General on to the Texas uh, commodity markets um, and then sort of after 2008-2009 sort of left the city and sort of took a little bit of a break um, then sort of uh, had a bit of a random meeting with, with somebody up here where I'm living now um, sort of went there sort of helped him sort of open his company uh, kind of like a, another training provider um, and then sort of got to the end of that and said right well now I'm going to go and teach people what I know which is institutional levels of supply and demand trading um, it is how trading's done at the top table. Uh, we'll obviously get into this a little bit more as we go through, um, but just to say, yeah, it is completely different um, to what people perceive it to be. There's not many people, I think, that are actually out there teaching retail traders like us to trade who got their start in an open outcry pit, you know, on the London Metal Exchange. Yep. So you're going to be bringing a completely different perspective and really interesting to me, and I dare say to a lot of people listening. So. Right, so I've been through your site. There is some sort of headline information on there about um, what you was, what you call uh, looking for supply and demand levels. Yeah. Uh, without giving away all your secret sauce, yep. could, could you give me an idea of just what exactly does that mean? Well, supply and demand is basically if if we break it down, and you know, uh, again, one of the common misconceptions about markets is that they're really, really complicated. And they're not. Um, all markets are essentially driven by supply and demand, which is cheaper, expensive, which is wholesale or retail. That's all the same thing. Um, but what we look for um, are levels that are cheap, levels that are expensive, on the basis of what's going on now. 
Okay, these levels have been established over decades. So we're not looking at what happened last week or the week before. We're looking at the big, big picture. Uh, and when you look at the big, big picture, it actually tells you what you need to know. You know where the flows are. You can see where the real money has moved to and from. Now, again, there's two sides of this business. I think I don't think a lot of retail traders understand this. Um, within the foreign exchange market, there are commercial users of the market and there are speculators that use the market. Um, the institutional brokers and the banks have to act as counterparties to both sides of this story. Um, but the commercial side of the business, which is made up of you know large conglomerate companies, importers and exporters um, and insurance companies, these guys use the foreign exchange market because they have to. They're not in it to speculate. They've got bills to pay. They've got invoices. They've got wages. They've got all this um, that's going on. And they essentially have to use the market in a different way. So just for an example, you've imported marble from Italy. You've got a 10 million euro um, invoice sitting on your desk, right? You can't send the guy sterling. He doesn't want it. So you've got to go into the market. You've got to sell sterling by euro. But on the other hand, you can't ring your guy in Italy and say, well, you know what? I think in the next week, the exchange rate is going to get better for me. So that's when I'm going to pay you. Because you can't, you can't <laughs> do that, right? That's not fair. So you you're pay when it's due. Yeah, exactly. Right? Ideally, not so that always you, happens. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't always happen, but you know, ideally. Um, but then you go to the market and you undertake basically a currency swap. You undertake it because you have to. What happens is, is the commercial side of the business over a period of time, and we, we don't, it's, you know, it's not a definitive amount of time, it's just over a period of time. They will move the market to a price level that is either cheap or expensive, and this is where the speculators come in because the speculators already know what's cheap and what's expensive. So then what happens is this is when the institutional brokers and the banks themselves act in the capacity of speculators. So in their normal day-to-day -day job, and which is why when you look at any particular chart, I mean, if any guys, if you're out there listening to this now, looking at your chart, the price is going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That is not the bank's trading for themselves or for the speculatory side of the business. That is the banks and the brokers acting in the capacity of commercial trading. And again, one of these misconceptions is, is that the banks are trading all the time. Yes, they are, but they're not trading for themselves. They're trading for their clients. Mm. It's, it's, it's called facilitating your client's order flow. It's no different if you go into McDonald's and you tell the kid behind the counter that, you know, you want a Big Mac fries and a Coke. He's facilitating your order flow. <laughs> So it's it's the same okay. thing, obviously a little bit, you know, a little bit more advanced, but it's it's a different um, aspect of this market that I don't think a lot of people understand because I, nobody is out there actually telling people this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I confess I fell into that that trap of every time I saw the price move. I'm assuming it's someone speculating on something I haven't heard about, but it sounds like that's just not actually the case. Right. So yeah. So if if we're looking at a company, let's say for. Uh, Cadelco, for instance. So Cadelco is, a, is, is obviously it's a South American mining company. Uh, they have lots of copper mines down there in Chile. Uh, they have to take out insurance premiums uh, with a broker, let's say, in Lloyd's of, uh, Lloyd's of London. Um, loss of production is obviously going to cost Cadelco money, so they want to insure themselves against that. Not sure if you guys remember the film uh, going back around about sort of seven or eight years ago with all the guys sort of trapped down in the mine. That was one of Cadelco's mines. Yeah, um, Banderas, I believe. Antonio. Yeah. <laughs> and and essentially what happens there is, is obviously there's loss of production. So Cadelco's taken out an insurance premium. They've got to pay the broker at Lloyd's in London in the local currency, obviously sterling. Um, but then sort of once that insurance premium or once that insurance uh, is basically kicked in, um, these guys don't want to be paid in sterling. They want to be paid in their local currency. So again, you know, the broker has to go to the market to do a currency swap. And also Cadelco has to do a currency swap. So these people, they're not, in there to speculate they don't really care what price they get they just have to do this business um now some entities like to do their business at the beginning of the day i.e london open and some prefer to do it at the london fix which is why you guys may have noticed um around about seven o'clock market's quite busy uh, four yeah. o'clock market's busy some and this is what happens again you know i've seen these crazy crazy things trade the london opening breakout strategy 
I mean, why? What are you doing? Are you not understanding? I must what's... confess that I looked into that. Because <laughs> I, I saw it and I thought, oh, this is all the London traders getting to their desk and they're going to try and, you know, take a part of the move that happened overnight in Asia. All right, let's do that. But you're telling me, no, that's not it. It's like, you know, shipping companies and miners and people buying currency to settle their business. Yeah, basically. And some some entities oh, right. like to do it at the beginning, some like to do it at the end. Another thing that will happen is, is, you know, you get one of your clients, they give you an order and they say, right, okay, if nothing done, just do it on the close. You know, just do it on the close. And then, uh, again, you have these two periods where the market's busy, but it's busy for a reason. I mean, this is, a, again, another sort of complete misconception. Let's just say that the euro has been shedding pips over the last two or three days. And then we get to sort of, let's just say, from Monday to Wednesday. We get to Thursday, Thursday morning, right? Now, there's a lot of buying orders around on the euro on Thursday morning. We don't know why, but there just is. There's lots of people that have to do their business Thursday morning, just happens to be. So when we look at the market on London Open and we start to see the euro going up in value, people will think, oh, right, it's bottomed out. Right, this is a, a retail way yeah. of looking at it. It's bottomed out. Look, the euro's going up. Then once all that business has been completed and you've gone long, what happens? normality resumes and the price keeps coming down and down and down and down just because that chunk of business had to be done at that particular time of the day and it's the same on the london close and it's the same for all markets i mean this is one of the things i really want to talk to talk to you guys about and to help people as as much as i can to understand every single market on this planet is traded in exactly the same way Supply, demand, cheap, expensive, wholesale, retail. It has nothing to do with chart patterns. It has nothing to do with trend lines. It has nothing to do with ridiculous candlestick formations. It's got nothing to do with time. So, I mean, just completely forget time. That's got nothing to do with trading whatsoever. It's all about price. And the thing is, is what's going on is hidden in plain sight. And I sort of alluded this to Tom uh, the other day. It's hidden in plain sight. These trading levels have been there for donkey's years. I mean, absolutely donkey's years. And, you know, you guys, you know, I'm sort of going to demonstrate that to you uh, sort of later on. Um, and then you guys can obviously make your sort of assessment from there and, and make your comments from there. We'll be going through uh, the euro dollar chart um, later on. But so just sort of look at it as a whole. Everybody thinks or has been directed to think put it this way directed to think that financial markets and trading is extremely complicated when it isn't it's not at all but every single market works on the law of supply demand cheap expensive wholesale retail whether you're trading stocks shares commodities indices currencies it makes no difference all right yeah so sort of just so sort of just leading on from that i mean it, it when you understand what trading is which is essentially the study of human behavior then you kind of you get away from what's the instrument that I'm looking at. Because if we think about it at the end of the day, guys, what is a chart? A chart is just a graphical representation of the value of an asset that's been placed upon it by a group of professional people, i.e. traders. Um, and because we are habitual creatures of habit, we will do the same things again and again and again and again. And that is to apply the same value to things again and again and again. So, I mean, if you sort of stop to think about it, um, you get your hair cut in the same place, you drink the same cup of coffee from the same place, you take it the same way, you read the same newspaper, you watch the same things on television. Now, if somebody's sort of outside of your sphere, let's say looking down on you, given an amount of time, they'll be able to sit there and predict what you're going to do. And this is what I teach people. You look to the past to tell you what's going to happen in the future because the same value or the valuations that have been placed upon currencies have been very, very consistent going back over 40 years. So once you understand that, it means that the, the, the guys that are trading today are looking at old farts like me. So what was he doing 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago? What was going on? You know, and then when we were young, we were looking at, you know, for example, people like my father, you know, what were they doing? And here's just a little thing. With the advent of computers and technology and these weird and wonderful ways of analysing markets, here's a question for you, Owen. What do you think we did before all of this was invented and available to us? Did we just sit there and twiddle our thumbs and say, I really <laughs> wish somebody would come up with a way to analyse these markets? Or did 
we trade using. I imagine you trade from price. Yeah, from price. <laughs> Oldest law of commerce. Yeah. Cheap and expensive, supply and demand. Yeah. That's what it is. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed at all. That's how institutions trade. So then... So go on. So if, I, if I'm following to now then, so it, there's, there's two sort of facets here. One is that the market is moving generally, not because of speculation, yep. but because of the natural function of the market and the fact that the foreign exchange market actually exists to ena- enable people to uh, conduct international commerce. Yep. And then when the, when that price moves, it will naturally reach points where uh, the, the 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 normal harmony, the normal ratios of those currencies to each other are either cheap or expensive. And that doesn't mean that it's then going to be reversed by a speculator, but rather that um, the natural balance of trade will then bring it back to a more normal ratio as seen, a normal level as seen over you know, many years of historical data. Yeah. And then, then, am I getting it right that then that's well, the move you then want to trade? Yeah, it's, it's the imbalance. What you're looking for is <clears throat> an imbalance in markets. So let's just say for argument's sake, uh, price on the euro is coming down. It's just been sort of flowing, 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 flowing. Um, today, we've got 500 selling orders on the euro. However, once we get to a particular price level, instead of just having, you know, five or 10 or 20 buying orders, I've got 5,000. So it's about options. And I don't mean, you know, calls and puts. It's about options. What options does this market have? It's coming down. We've got selling orders. We've now got 300 selling orders running into 5,000 buying orders. Bang. There's only one way that that market can go mm. now. It can only go back up again. Okay. So you're talking about like market profile. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that it's, what, what it's called? It, yeah. So there's, there's the volume that's there. You can't see it because you don't have the flow around you. But you don't need to see it in a retail yeah. market to know that it's there. And it's because once you know where these trading levels are, then when you go back and you check and you're like, I don't believe that. <laughs> it's literally it's hidden there in plain sight and I, kind of I suppose what I do is to give people the Rosetta Stone you know to unlock what's on your chart be able to read it properly you know there are three mm. different types of candlestick that's it there's a demand candle there's a supply candle and then there's a crossover candle when something that was cheap has become expensive or was expensive and has become cheap based upon an external factor which may be like an interest rate rise or something like that or an interest rate cut and that's what really drives markets. And so why would there be um, a level where sudden you've got 300 sell orders yep. but 5,000 buy orders? And um, if, as you said before, the you know, the large organizations that are buying and selling currencies to conduct their business, they're not speculating. Yep. They're just doing it when they have to do it. So you're, but you're saying the price is cheap at that level and therefore – or, or expensive or yep, whatever, and therefore the there are more orders at that level. I don't understand. How, so, okay, so this is it. So this, so it moves to that point, yes. but then all the speculators go, right, it's yes. now cheap, and it's now expensive, and that's where all their orders are. Yeah, and you basically, and you want to be I mean, that's the thing. Once you sit down with me and you understand what it is that I do and what I teach, which is obviously, you know, we're going to sit down and do that as well, you will see beyond doubt where the order flow actually really lays in the market. And when I show you charts, uh, we're going to go through one today, which will be the euro chart. I'm going to show you that the trading levels that are used today were established before you were even born. <laughs> okay. Right? Which, <laughs> even if the currency wasn't. Even if the Well, if, well the, again, this is the thing. Now, if you and anybody else out there that's, that, that's listening to this, you could only trade the euro from the 1st of Jan, 1999. So I want each one of you to now look at your euro chart, put it on a monthly, go to the 1st of Jan, 1999, and then look left. What's that? Oh, right. If you couldn't trade it, what's that? <laughs> yeah, what is that? That's the European currency. What is it, right? It's the European currency unit, the EQ. Now, the EQ was the precursor of the euro. Okay, you couldn't physically walk into a bank and say, can I have 500 EQs, please? But it was an investment vehicle. Yeah. Okay, it was an investment vehicle. Now, if we understand that, and you say, okay, so there's obviously a lot more history to this. 
there's a lot more that I should be looking at. There's another 20 years worth of history that people don't even take into account. Well, actually, yesterday's pivot point is because probably less it, important <laughs> than, than oh, we think it is. Mate, it's... Well, you know, I mean, listen, again, you know, I alluded this to Tom earlier. If, if you're looking at it, and we'll just do really simple and easy maths here. If you're looking at a chart, okay, that's got 20 years worth of history, let's just call it 50 weeks just for real simple and easy maths, that's 1,000 weeks. Mm-hmm. Okay, 1,000 weeks worth of history, okay, that's going to tell you what's been going on. Now, if you're looking at what happened last week... You're using one thousandth of a, you know, of the information that's available to you. And and do you not, not believe that that, the though, that the greater relevance and greater weight should be given to the more recent information if that's what's fresh in people's minds? No, because that's what they want you to do. And I'll call it the royal they. Okay. Okay. The they man. want you to believe that. <laughs> yeah, okay. you know, Big Brother and all that. But no, that's what they want you to believe. <laughs> that last week is more relevant than 20 years ago. That's complete BS. Because what was expensive 20 years ago and 15 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago, guess what's going to happen if the price gets there today? You've got a massively high probability that the institutions are still going to place the same valuation upon it, which means if it gets there, bang, it's going to get sold off again. So Mm. what happened last week, in the grand scheme of things... Is not really that relevant. And what happened okay. last week, if it hit a supply and demand level and it bounced off of it, what's happened was the same thing that's always happened. This is the thing. Once we free, so our, not- yeah, once we free our mind of thinking about time, thinking about indicators, thinking about um, combinations of, thinking about chart patterns, thinking about all of these ridiculous things that make trading sound really complicated, and it is done on purpose – because if you really knew how simple it really, really was, you'd never pay anybody to bloody trade for you. You'd never put money with a, a money manager. You'd sit down and go, I can do this myself. What you know, I don't need to pay because it's not complicated. You know, the whole world works under all supply and demand, whether it's fruit, whether it's cars, whether it's houses, whether it's whatever. Financial markets are no different. Human beings. And so it habit. sounds to me like the the key then is finding the levels finding the yes. the the cheap and the expensive levels yeah. and it's you just said there it's it's simple to do um obviously this is part of your program but but i mean how simple is it is it once you know the secret you can do it like like in two seconds flat there is you know is it comp- like when you say it's simple is it is it truly just like if you just look at it and you can see it on the graph well, yeah, once you know what you're looking for so like i say um, I don't know, if, don't know if anybody else out there, there's a bit of a strange analogy, but just go with me on it. Um, these magic eye pictures that you used to get sort of back in the back yeah. in the 90s and whatever, the early 2000s, the ones where it was like a, a, a flat 2D surface. And then if you looked at it in a particular way, the picture then drops back to reveal a 3D image. And it's kind of like that, right? So you're looking at the chart one way, and you can't see it. And then you look at the chart another way after we've been through it together, and you'll get to the point where you can't look at the market in any other way. Because you'll then sit there and you'll go, yeah. well, there's no trend line there. Uh, there's no chart pattern there. Yeah. <laughs> um, time's got nothing to do with it. What's going on here? And you'll start to look at the market in a completely different way. But you, that's how you need to look at it. You know, just because you've been told by your broker, uh, just because you've been told somebody on LinkedIn, just because you've watched a video on YouTube or on Google, you can read so much stuff and the market is so saturated with basically people that don't know what goes on at institutional level. And I think that's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous because at the end of the day there... um, I mean, you certainly wouldn't let an, an unqualified doctor operate on you just because he'd read a few things on you know google watched a few videos on youtube you know you, cer- <laughs> you certainly wouldn't yeah um <laughs> it's a fair point i mean you're absolutely right well you know um 
there are it, 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 the more we we spend more time we spend in, in doing this and the more people we speak to it does seem like there is a, a stark divide between the retail trading way of doing things um and I, you know I, I do believe that people do make money doing it like that and they find little things that can work but it's it, it's it's very patient and very disciplined um you just tapped into something there i mean which which i hadn't mentioned before day trading um so everybody out there that's listening to this uh, day trading is not the way to make money um and the reason being is we, we alluded to it earlier institutional order flow right so your clients are calling in at any given time of the day and they're telling you i need to do this i need to do that go and do this for me go and do that for me okay got to facilitate your order flow so if i'm sitting there at my desk and the phone rings and i pick it up and it's my client there's only one thing I know he's going to say to me. Hello. After that, I don't know what he's going to tell me. So if you're trying to day trade, essentially, really, what you're trying to do is you're trying to preempt what the bank's clients are going to tell the bank to do at any given time of the day. And I'm sorry, but the banks don't bloody know that. So how you're going to sit there and try and forecast it by using indicators and really small time frames? It's. It, oh, I mean, look, you'll get lucky sometimes, but can, uh, to be very, very consistent and do it every single day, it's a bloody hard job. Okay, so day trading, it sounds like uh, you're you're on that the side of the divide. There's very much not a fan of that, and sees it more akin to to gambling, uh, or at least trying to get lucky, as you say, over a consistent period of time. So. Yeah. What's the contrast? So, with with, with your sort of trading, uh, how often are you trading, um, and 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 how long are you holding those for? Okay, and these are these are great questions. Um, you, you, your broker loves you to day trade. I mean, loves it. <laughs> yes. You know, we'll 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 send you out as much gump as you want to as, as you want to go through. Um, it's, it's it's hazardous because again, people can get very addicted to trading. It's that adrenaline rush, bang, 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 money, 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 money. Um, and you need to step away from that. You need to really sort of take a step back and look at the bigger picture. So, I mean, what we do here is we look at we look at history, at least 20 years worth of history on a monthly chart. That's what we do. And then from there, we pick our levels. And then from there, once we've picked our levels, we can sort of go in maybe perhaps on a weekly, just make a few adjustments. Only reason being, you know, sometimes when you move, the, you know, you move the cursor on a chart on a monthly, it moves it a heck of a lot of pips. Yeah, so you, yeah. you don't have to justify going to a weekly chart as being too short term for us. Don't uh, worry. Uh, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's so go okay, so there, and then to trade it on a daily. But you're only looking at the chart on a daily. Okay. On, on a, you're looking at price. Right, so let's not say well, we're only trading it on a daily. No, you're looking at what's happening in that 24-hour period. That's what you want to do, uh, because sort of once level has been broken and it's closed above or closed below, it, within a 24-hour period, you can then say, okay, so the market's now changed its tact. What was cheap is now expensive. What was expensive is now cheap. Sure, we will have times when the markets are in indecision mode, but again, it's not you know trade, 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 trade don't have to you can take a real big step back um something that i said to tom uh, which is very i think quite a poignant thing if i was to say to you right owen um in the next 12 months mate i want you to go and pull five thousand pips out of the market mm. your reaction would be like <laughs> challenge accepted but possibly <laughs> not succeeded okay <laughs> so if i was to say to you right let's sit down and let's do 10 charts correctly supply and demand levels all mapped out could you go and make 500 pips on each in a 12 month period being very selective well, i mean you think you yeah trading a on a daily chart across weekly monthly uh wider charts over 20 years of data you think 500 pips should be doable you know um if, if you call in the right direction i guess my my fear there as a retail trader and probably i've been conditioned to think like this is oh my god how big is my stop loss gonna have to be am i gonna have to have a 250 no, stop loss no, like, no, 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 mate. No, not at know. all i mean that's the thing as well that's the key um because once you know where these levels are you can use very small stops very small stops. Okay. Um, again, depending on what sort of person you are, what sort of trader you are, and what your what your makeup is, there's various different ways to exit a trade. Three to one risk reward ratio. Boom. Okay, that's all right. Um, I want to try my stop. Okay, that's all right. I want to trade it from level to level. Okay, that's okay as well. 
you know, I'm not here to say to people, right, you must rigidly, rigidly stick to this. You know, don't you? You, you have to be able to um, manage your trades. You know, the, obviously, the ultimate way to trade it is from mm. level to level. That's the ultimate way to trade it. How long will you be in a trade? You might be in a trade for two or three weeks. But if you've taken one position to take 500 pips out of the market in a trade, then I'd rather do that than sit there and go, right, okay, in order to get 500 pips, I'm going to have to take 50 trades. And I'm going to try and nick 10 pips on each. Yeah. Right? Which, again, is more psychologically damaging because you actually... Well, it is. Oh, awesome. just, it must be, right? It must be. Um, but you're risking your money 50 times in order to achieve the same thing that I'm doing when I've risked it once. Do you know what I mean? And that's in order point. to that's get really 50 trades yeah. correct and get 10 pips from each, that's a heck of a lot of work. And I don't think you'll probably get 50 trades correct. You know? No. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I just don't think it's going to happen. You know, you, you might do it over a course of a year, but I don't think you're going to do it consecutively. Okay. You know, which so, is... So flipping it slightly... Yeah. And back to um, this concept that this is how the institutions do it. If yeah. if, if, if it is as, as simple as this, and it sounds like it's, you know, when you explain it like that, it doesn't sound like rocky stuff. I'm sure there's more to it. But, you know, after training, you know, you, you turn up as a graduate or a youngster at a, an investment bank, you get some training, you're mm-hmm. then trading, you're doing this. If everyone else is doing pretty similar things, and if yep. all a lot of traders, certainly forex traders, are looking to do the same thing, how does a trader differentiate themselves in that market and be a really good trader, a superstar trader, if, every, if, it's, if it's quite simple and everyone's doing it and they've all been trained to do the same thing? Um, well, it takes character, it takes consistency, um, it takes a logical mind. Um, you know, I've worked with some absolutely fantastic traders through, you know, through my career. Um, just the ability to read markets, um, having the cojones to hold on to a trade um, and not cut things. I mean, that's, that's the thing as well. I mean, traders at institutional level, put, put it this way, they're no smarter they're no cleverer than the man on the street. They just do it as a day job. So for for us, it, it, it's like because you do it every day, things just become more natural to you, you know. And because you're doing it every yeah. day, um, to sort of to, to stand out from the crowd, it's, it's obviously the guy that makes the most money. Essentially, at the end yep. of the day, it's the guy that makes the most money. Um, a true meritocracy. Yeah, I mean, what goes into the psychological makeup of a trader? I don't know what makes some people better than others. I don't know. I can't give you a difference. But it sounds like the answer is similar to um, what you would hear in the retail trading circles about psychology, risk management, uh, getting tuned into the markets. It's just you're coming at it from a different place, from a different um, fundamental set of uh, beliefs about what moves the market yeah. and where it's going to move. Yeah. Um, but those have been put together by numerous professional well-paid traders in major investment banks over yeah. decades. So they certainly be- are worth bearing in yeah. mind. Uh, can I just uh, just at this point as well, because I really did sort of want to sort of um, present this issue um, to people out there and, and, and to you guys as well. Um, I wrote an article on LinkedIn, um, which got which was received very, very, very well. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have probably read it. Um, well, then I wrote another one about traders versus analysts. Okay, who influence who influences yeah. who? Now you can say to me, and there'll be many people out there thinking this exact thing at the moment. Yeah, but the banks send out reports that contain MACD, RSI, Elliott waves, stochastics, trend lines. Yes, they do. Why? Because if an analyst comes over to a trader and he says, right, what are you doing? I'm buying here. I'm selling here. Bugger off. Leave me alone. I'm busy. I haven't got hours to sit here and go through a chart and make analysis fit. See, this is the thing, right? Nobody's going to come out and tell you this because obviously it would be bloody career suicide and, you know, the whole house of cards could come tumbling down very quickly. But this is the thing. What does an analyst do? He has to work with the trader. He has to know what the trader's mindset is and what he's going to be doing. The bank's clients don't just want to receive a two-line email because if you're paying the bank millions of dollars, oh, right. yeah, right. Right. if you're bought. paying the bank millions of dollars a year in commission to trade, <laughs> you don't just want a bloody two-line email that says I'm buying here and selling here. You want to think that you're getting value for money. So this is where the analysts come in. So then the analyst takes away this two-line email 
and he sends it to a full page dossier. And he goes to the chart and he says, right, well, let's put a Fibonacci level on here. It doesn't really line up. OK, well, let's not use that one today then. Right, we've got a trend line here. The RSI says this. Uh, you know, a couple of these moving averages have done that. That fits a lot better. That fits what he said. Right, OK. So now what we'll do is, is we'll now go and write a load of blurb as well to justify why we've used these pieces of analysis and to why the bank's doing this. Where's the value? Mm. Perception. It's where the guy said, I want to buy and sell. Yeah. And it's perception because if you're looking at this from the, from the outside and these reports are available to retail traders in the market, I'm sure you have, probably have to pay for them. But if you were looking at that, you would naturally assume that this is what the banks are doing. And the banks are not going to come out and say, no, that's not what we do. Because we trade on supply and demand. <laughs> They're not, they're not going to tell you. So it's hidden. It is hidden in plain sight. It's there to be, oh, good God, that's extremely complicated. <laughs> uh, it's not. It's just been made to look that way, you know. So analysts, and you read all of these people, and they say, oh, there's a double bottom, there's a doji candle, there's a bloody sauce bun, there's, a, there's you know, there's cup and saucers, there's head and shoulders. Please leave me alone. <laughs> Not a fan. Why? Because you can only bloody tell me when it's completed. So what's the point? Yeah, you need to know it's coming before. Head and that shoulders happens. completed. Yeah, head and shoulders completed on the euro. Thanks. Why did you tell me that six months ago? Well, I didn't know it was going to start then. Right. Thanks. You know what is the point? There is no point because it's just window dressing. Paul, it sounds like you've got a. Uh really strong feelings on this built up over years of experience in the, in the institutions then coming out and seeing what it is that the, that the retail guys are doing um and i dare say a lot of people will be listening to this thinking right i need more information on that so uh paul scott yep. please paul scott fx.com uh, a very simple website yep. and, and you do one-to-one -one mentoring it's not a uh download yep. this this video but, and and see it later yeah. it's one-to-one -one mentoring so if people want to really understand yeah. it they can go there and find yeah, you can you can only do that on a one to one basis at the end of the day. I mean, you can only do that. Do you know what I mean? When you actually f sit down with somebody and take them through it, it's done via screen sharing software. You know, nobody has to travel. Uh, you know, you learn in your own environment, which I think most people feel a lot more comfortable in. Um, you do it on a one to one basis because at any point, if you've got a question, we can just stop. You know, and we can do that. You can't do that in a classroom because then everybody's sticking their hand up and you never get anywhere. I dare say so that's how you learn when you're in institutions, right? Someone mentored you and told you how to do it. Yeah, yeah. You sat there with the guys, you observed what they were doing, you know, and then as you got older, other people did the same thing to you. You know, right. so it's, it's sort of on the job learning there. But I mean, it's, you've got to have some, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, even if nobody visits the website from this, that's fine. I don't mind. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, that's fine. I don't mind. If you've had your mind programmed into believing all of this trading gump that's out there that's fine but if you yes. are out there and, and you're sitting there thinking mm, actually what he says actually makes makes a bit of sense then come visit the website get in contact and actually sort of sit down with me and let me show you what it is and the greatest thing for me is your eureka moment your aha and uh, we're all going to be taking us, uh, me and Tom, through some of this uh, shortly as yep. well. So we can report back uh, after this in, in the, the magical uh, uh, time machine of podcast editing uh, in, in a few seconds. So uh, Paul, paulscottfx.com, yep. link will be in the show notes. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been very good fun and very, very informative. So it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers, Paul. I really liked that interview. Personally, kind of... It kind of, I don't know whether it's just because it's saying what I want to hear about the industry that it is. It is based in very much technical stuff. Techni you know, you te you know, if you, you can trade technically, just having an understanding of the way the banks are trading and just leveraging their buying and selling power just to just to take those profits. Um, and then almost ignoring the fundamental elements because when the fundamental elements do kick in, like the interest rate hikes or whatever, and it does push up to the next range essentially – a predefined range then you can then start getting in again and just you know yeah you take a few bit of losses but when you're taking 300 pip 
uh, wins, then it's probably worth the uh, worth the damage. Or yeah, worth, worth the a forty pip stop loss or two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's almost not even technical training. It's just basic price levels, isn't it? No indicators, no, no nothing. Um, because obviously, as we alluded to in the interview, you and I then had a, a quick session with Paul where he took us through on the screens in more detail. Um, you know, sort of the first part of the, the course he sells. And um, like one thing he said to me, I sort of I was vaguely skeptical. One thing he said was, "You're thinking it can't be this easy. It can't be this simple." But it is. <laughs> yeah. Now, this may be a great sales pitch, and so don't get me wrong. You know, it's not a. It's not like we've gone away and tested it and stuff. So it's not. But. It, you know, it was fascinating to hear and the, and the level of conviction that Paul had uh, on in his belief and efficacy of what he was talking about, again, built, built from my side, built that confidence up. Yeah, and he's a man that's been there and done it. He has worked at investment banks for many, many years as a trader. This is what he says he was taught. This is what he traded and this is what he then taught other people. And his yeah. father was a trader and his, I think, sister was a, works for a bank. You know, he's, he's got pretty good pedigree from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. And... um. I, it's it's funny because part of me hopes it's not that simple. That kind of <laughs> knobby, twatty part of me that that wants it to be really hard and wants to master something really difficult to do. And I have the fear that it's actually really quite basic. And the reason people fail is because they overcomplicate it. Because most people sell something that is difficult in order to charge you a lot of money for it. Um, that may or may not be the case. I don't really know. But that so I have these twin fears nagging at me off the back of speaking of Paul. <laughs> Yeah, but at least, again, like everything we, we always try and do on TBT, we just try to open up different avenues, different thought processes. And just, just you know, if and again, if, if you're interested, we can then go in to do more research around it in the future. Exactly. And we'll get a link to Paul on the show notes. So anyone else that wants to find out more can go and check him out. He's, he's big into mentoring, isn't he? He doesn't really have like a video course or something. As far as, Is that right, Tom? Is he, he sort of shows you himself or something like that? Yeah, he's just a... One one on one kind of guy who just sit down and, and just chat to you really and explain it because it isn't that complicated and and what he does but it is it just takes a bit of time for him to kind of reset your um your, your preconceptions and then to his way of thinking is what I think is is kind of what he what he does and gives you yeah and I think that it fits into a theme we've had here on two weeks trading a number of times which is about trying to understand how it's done by people who go to an office where someone else pays them to do it and where they're taught how to do it by people that have already done it for many years and been paid to do it. Because it is pretty much a fact that the investment banks seem to make loads of money trading currencies and other things all the time. And that can't all be down to the fact that they can move markets with, or this and that because there's loads of them. You know, if it, it, There's got to be more to it than that. So, Yeah, and I said to Paul, it feels that easy. Um, surely the traders are just sitting around, sitting on their hands the whole time because they're just waiting for it to come to these levels. And he said, well, that's not the case because they're they're busy dealing with their clients, doing the commercial element of the trading yeah. until it gets to those levels where then he comes in, they come in themselves and do the speculation with the bank's money. So, you know, so they, they are always busy. So that's why, you know, you hear that traders are working hard is because they are dealing with the commercial and the speculation elements to it, apparently. Oh, I see. Yeah, I <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, because I suppose if... Um you know, AXA life want to repatriate a whole bunch of euros into pounds or whatever, they're not going to trade it themselves. They're going to have a trader and investment bank who does it for them. Exactly. Yeah. And then charges a healthy fee as well, I would presume. Um, 